welcome to the Acupuncture Outsider podcast. My name is Richard Hazel, and in the time it takes for you to commute to or from work, I hope to have shared something of interest about orthopedic acupuncture using motor points, trigger points, myofascial slings, uh, neurofunctional acupuncture, segmental treatments, anything that crosses my mind that seems to be of interest. I hope you'll enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Acupuncture Outsider. This is Richard Hazel. Um, today I have a plan of, of talking about um, muscle fiber orientation and its relevance to muscle testing and um, just understanding the body and sort of the wonders of the human body. Well, I'm sure the the same applies to my dog's muscles. Um, so just the wonders of the mammal uh, musculoskeletal system. Um, so what I, what I wanted to talk about was fiber orientation. Um, if you've watched any of Brent Brookbush um, education on Brookbush Institute, one of the one of the best explanations I've seen for understanding muscle muscle testing and muscle that's like muscle um, manual muscle testing with resistance or um, also length testing. Um, Brett Brookbush explains that a muscle can only contract. That's all it can do. And why is that important? It's important to understand that the multiple movements that a muscle can often do has to do with muscle fiber orientation. So, for example, um, the gluteus medius is like a fan. It um, Most of the fibers are or oriented in a parallel um, midsection from the iliac crest to the greater trochanter, and that allows us to abduct the hip and to stabilize the hip when we walk. Um, some of the fibers that are attached to the iliac crest because of the shape of the iliac crest are more to the anterior part of the gluteus medius, and that puts the those fibers at an angle that when the fiber contracts in the front, it allows for the gluteus medius to assist on internal rotation of the hip. And then you have some of the fibers in the back of the gluteus medius that go back along the iliac crest. And because of the angle, when the posterior fibers contract, it allows the gluteus medius to assist on external rotation of the hip. And all of that is magically done by the nervous system. It can differentiate those fibers and contract more of one part of that muscle than the other, uh, which is amazing. When you look at the trapezius, um, we learn the trapezius in three sections. We call the upper trapezius, the middle trapezius, and the lower trapezius. And we learn them that way because of their different functions. Um, the lower trapezius can help upward rotation of the scapula, and the middle trapezius can retract the scapula, and the upper trapezius can do upward rotation of the scapula. But the trapezius is all one muscle with one innervation and multiple fiber directions. So you have fiber orientation that changes the uh, function of the trapezius. But the trapezius is just you know muscle um, muscle fibers, muscle cells that can only do one thing: contract. The differentiation is being done by the nervous system, the 
the body can differentiate what fibers to contract harder than the others. So I find that really fascinating. And I bring it up because I was recently thinking about shoulder flexion. I have a patient who had a shoulder, she had infraspinatus uh, injury done by uh, someone who did her COVID vaccine injection. And she said her, her shoulder has never been the same since over a year ago since that injection. And, and right after the injection, she had a lot of inflammation and pain in her shoulder. And she, she described the shoulder pain and she's a, um, she's a hairstylist. So she stands all day and she has her arms out all day holding things. So it matters to her a lot um, that she has this shoulder pain that's ongoing for over a year. And so she was explaining to me the pattern of the pain, and it goes from the back of the like posterior deltoid around the side and to the front. And I recognize that pain pattern from people who have had infraspinatus tendon issues, like uh, partial tears, things like that. So my suspicion was that, she, sorry, my dog is dreaming and, and barking. Um, my, um, my suspicion was that the injection went into the tendon and there was some sort of spastic response from the infraspinatus that tightened up and she was in pain ever since. Um, so I did muscle testing and confirmed infraspinatus and treated it, and I heard through the grapevine that she is much, much better after that one treatment of her infraspinatus. So I was thinking about infraspinatus and the fiber orientation of infraspinatus, and if you're thinking about it, it runs across the scapula. It runs, runs pretty much across the side, to the side. Um, and then, you know, that tendon wraps around the humerus and inserts somewhere toward the front of the humerus, allowing us to do external rotation with the infraspinatus. And as a rotator cuff muscle, it's important just to remind everybody that while they all have functions like internal and external rotation, their primary function is stabilization of the glenohumeral joint. So they they contract strongly to force the head of the humerus into the gleno, glenoid fossa for stabil, stabilization. Um, the, the shoulder is interesting that way. A lot of its stabilization and a lot of the reason that, we, um, that it won't um, pop out of the joint um, unless there's an injury is the muscle, the muscle tendons uh, strongly stabilize. It's um, force closure. If you study um, Andre Vlaming, he talks about form closure and force closure. And form closure is usually done by bones um, or, or like the labrum of the hip and all those uh, um, ligaments that keep the hip in place. But the shoulder doesn't have as many ligaments to hold it in place. So a lot of it is being held in by force closure from the rotator cuff muscles. So um, so I was thinking about the infraspinatus, and I was going to talk about how um, one of the telltale signs of an infraspinatus issue is when a person does shoulder flexion, reaching up in front of them, reaching toward to pick up a coffee cup, or reaching up into a cabinet, or reaching up to the shower curtain, um, they get a deep pain in the front of the shoulder. And this is a well-known um, infraspinatus issue. Um, and when people transition from doing traditional Chinese acupuncture to doing more orthopedic acupuncture, this is sometimes a surprise to them because they have been taught in acupuncture school to put needles in the front of the shoulder for anterior shoulder pain. and and that's all good and well if the shoulder pain is coming from the anterior deltoid or perhaps the coracobrachialis. Um, but when it's the infraspinatus, it's not going to help um, or not very much. So 
Um, so it's an interesting thing to be aware of. But I was thinking about, and I and I was Googling, um, what are the primary flexors of the shoulder? Because I think of the primary flexors of the shoulder um, being the anterior deltoid and the coracobrachialis and sometimes partially the clavicular head of the pectoralis. And sometimes when you're palm up, especially the, the, the long head of the bicep. Um, so I was looking, I was just Googling just to see like, what is the research on this? And some references do say that the infraspinatus is a primary flexor of the shoulder. And I kind of scratched my head because yes, you get deep pain in the joint with flexion of the shoulder when the infraspinatus is injured. Um, so yeah, I can see that we could say that we can't flex the shoulder without the infraspinatus, or at least that the infraspinatus is involved in shoulder flexion. But when we think about fiber orientation, how in the world does the infraspinatus flex the shoulder? To the, I'm just, just thinking like raise your arm in front of you and how does infraspinatus do that? So what I'm going to propose is that we think about the fiber orientation for the primary muscles that flex the shoulder and see if you agree with my conclusion about how infraspinatus assists shoulder flexion. So we know it does external rotation, right? I mean, that's the muscle test you're going to do for infraspinatus. Um, it's going to be an external rotation um, force that you're going to have the patient resist against, and that's going to confirm that the infraspinatus is injured. Um, and in fact, with an infraspinatus injury, you can fairly successfully test the anterior deltoid with a manual muscle test, and you will not elicit pain even when the infraspinatus is injured. So there, are, there is a range where the infraspinatus injury will not cause anterior shoulder pain. Um, so... Okay, so here's my theory. So I'm thinking about um, fiber orientation. So I think about fiber orientation for the anterior deltoid. You know, it's kind of at an angle. So when you flex the shoulder, you raise your arm in front of you, the deltoid is lifting the humerus, but the fiber orientation to me says there should be some internal rotation of the shoulder that will happen from just the deltoid alone. And the same can be said for coracobrachialis because it goes from the um, coracoid process on the front of the scapula at an angle down to the humerus, um, several inches below the uh, shoulder joint. And then the pec major, just the clavicular head, by the way, is going to be helping with flexion. And if you look at the fiber orientation for the clavicular head, you've got, you've got fibers attached to the clavicle and then over to the humerus, that intratubercular sulcus at the front of the humerus. So you have another angle. It's another it's another angled muscle. So my opinion, and then bicep, like really long, you know, biceps really long head of the bicep has the best shot at a straight up flexion when it shortens. Um, but when the anterior deltoid, the coracobrachialis and the clavicular head of the, of the pectoralis major contract, because all they can do is shorten. Then if you think about like a pulley system, aren't they all going to slightly internally rotate the shoulder via the humerus attachments? I think yes. So I think that the dynamic stabilization 
of the shoulder joint that's done by the rotator cuff and two of those rotator cuff muscles are, are external rotators, the teres minor and the infraspinatus. I think that dynamic stabilization is what corrects for the slight internal rotation that could happen from the front muscles when they when you flex the shoulder. I think that with them both contracting at the same time that you can correct for that slight angle and you can get a solid flexion of the shoulders straight to the front. And, you know, I was looking all over uh, to try to find somebody who would talk about that. I have not found it yet. If you guys know of, of some, you know, scientific research or something, um, you know, whatever, kinesiology, I don't know what, what, we call it, you know, sports kinesiology or something. But I would be very happy to see that confirmation that that's what's happening, that the infraspinatus is correcting for the internal rotation because it externally rotates. In infraspinatus teres minor can correct for that to give us a solid flexion straight to the front. Um, because even the short head of the bicep Let's say you're doing flexion, you know, with the palm up in a supinated form. That's most likely when you're going to get more bicep um, into the shoulder flexion. And even in that situation, the short head is still going to the coracoid process, which is still going to be a little internally rotated. Um, the bicep uh, tendon even is going to be uh, going lateral toward the radius. So I think you're still going to have a slight bit of internal rotation from the bi from the long head of the bicep. So really keeping it straight to the front, it's, it's some neurological trick that I think is happening due to the rotator cuff. Um, curious to see what you guys think. Um, I would love to see the science on that. I, it's not been explained well by most of the sources that I rely on for, um, you know, they just list the muscles that do shoulder flexion. And some of them say infraspinatus and some of them don't. Um, so that's, you know, that's all about fiber orientation. And I think it's fascinating. Um, another thing about fiber orientation, when you're doing manual muscle testing, I like to manual muscle test the hip abductors with the patient recumbent on their side. Um, and when you think about the fiber orientation for gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and TFL, it explains the way that I like to manual muscle test. And I, you know, I learned this from others. It's not like I made this up. Um, I think it's even the Kendall approach, the Kendall um, text for manual muscle testing. But look, put the patient sideline, right? So the main orientation of gluteus medius, the, the high percentage of fibers runs straight up and down from the iliac crest to the, to the greater trochanter. So the patient's um, hips are stacked, legs are straight, and you just have them lift the leg up and you give them some resistance for three seconds, right? The gluteus minimus fibers run toward the anterior aspect of the hip, the greater trochanter. So there is a, an anterior angle to the gluteus minimus, which allows it to do abduction and internal rotation. Now, it is not a hip flexor. However, think of the fiber orientation and shorten the gluteus minimus in your mind. Does that not increase an anterior pelvic tilt? I would say it does. So when you're approaching something from a lower cross syndrome approach, consider the gluteus minimus as well as a as a hip flexor that can increase anterior pelvic tilt. 
Um, but that's why I will move the leg forward about 15 degrees in um, more uh, hip flexion with the leg straight and then have the patient abduct and then give me some resistance for three seconds. And if that's weak, I'm going to say it's more gluteus minimus than it is gluteus medius. And then another 15 degrees forward and we test that as the TFL. And then the TFL is um, ASIS to the uh, IT band, basically. Um, so a little bit farther forward, and we're taking the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus a bit more out of the picture, allowing TFL to be the primary abductor. Um, and the, by the way, the TFL and the gluteus minimus are your hip stabilizers of last resort because your gluteus medius is too tight and weak. Glute med can become inhibited and tight. Um, and so when that fails, then your glute min and your TFL will uh, be your primary uh, stabilizers. And they're the ones that are getting prone, they're prone to getting tight and short and causing a lot of hip pain. So um, just don't forget that those they are they're like the upper trap that which is like the upward rotator of last resort or even the abductor of last resort they the upper trap cannot abduct the shoulder but when your abduction of of your shoulder is weak or non-existent you will use your upper trap to raise your arm to do things like put your jacket on and the upper, so the upper trap is your abductor of last resort, even though it can't abduct. Does that make sense? It's like lifting your shoulder, lifting your shoulder to pretend it can abduct. Um, so your TFL and your glute min are your are are going to be your hip stabilizers of last resort, and they can abduct and they can stabilize the hip. But the gluteus medius, which is a bigger muscle and supposed to be the primary, um, will fail. If you're, if you're having hip pain, that's most likely what's going on, or at least a big part of it. So, um, so I'm just talking about fiber orientation. Um, so manual muscle testing, you should think about fiber orientation because it will help you to understand not just how your manual muscle test is working, but how to improve patient positioning to get the best um, isolation of the fibers that you are testing against. So, you know, when you're testing, length testing the pectoralis major, there are a couple you want to consider. One, the patient's arm are out straight out to the side like a T, and that is testing those, the orientation of that clavicular head and then when they are in like a Y position, like when people do YMCA at the game, at the football game, then that is going to be the sternal head, the big part of the pectoralis major. And those fibers, if you look at the fiber orientation, that's the way they run. And that's how you line up your patient for good uh, length testing. You could do it for muscle testing, manual muscle testing as well. But fiber orientation is key. So when you take a look at anatomy books, look at the fiber orientation. It helps you to understand how something like the gluteus maximus does external rotation. You look at the lower fibers of the gluteus maximus. That's the part that actually is attached to the humerus, I mean the uh, femur. And that is what's going to have, that's what's going to help external rotation at the end of the gait cycle, so like right at like toe off, right before the swing phase, your your glute max is doing more external rotation as we want it to. So um, so look at your anatomy books and look at fiber orientation and remember that the fibers can just shorten. That's all they can do. The rest is neurological. The body can engage different parts of that muscle. Um, very intuitively, subconsciously. Um, but look at those fibers because it really helps you to recognize the, the function of the muscle. 
and how best to assess it with leg testing and manual muscle testing. And it, you know, and it, it sort of illuminates some of these things like what I was talking about with shoulder flexion and how does the rotator cuff get involved? Um, it's just, it's the body's fascinating. And when you think about things like that, the fiber orientation, it helps to put things together for you, especially if you're new to orthopedics, really looking at the origin insertion action of the muscle and the fiber orientation gives you a lot of clues about how things do more than one thing like adductors can help with hip flexion um you know it's just there are a lot of really fascinating things uh, based on how the body lays out those muscle fibers look at the brachioradialis and how it crosses over to the styloid process of the radius so that when those fibers um, shorten, not only will it flex the elbow, but it will supinate the forearm, the wrist, uh, the forearm. Yeah, just basically, you know, turn the palm up because the muscle is just shortening. But because of how it's attached at an angle, it will supinate. So the biceps do too, by the way. Um, so it's always good to look at those connections and see why a shortening muscle does what it does to the joint that you're thinking about. Okay, so um, I guess that's what I was going to, uh, I think I covered what I really wanted to talk about. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to call this podcast, but I think it's something about the fiber, uh, muscle fiber orientation and actions of the muscle. Um, okay, so I hope that wasn't too nerdy. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk about some cases soon. All right. Have a good one.